Hello Twitch and happy Saturday. Very excited to be here. It's been a while since I've been streaming. It's always fun to uh, send the data science vibes out there into the Twitch Twitchiverse, if there is such a thing. Uh, I'll just dive right in into what we're going to be doing and I'll have time for chatting a little later. Let's see, today we're doing, whoops, <laughs> the top five churn rate calculations in SQL. Well, then I'm gonna go and go through some of the setup that we're doing. Um, previously on the last stream, I ran a data simulation and saved all the data in a database instance in Google Cloud. Uh, for this stream, I have already started the database instance. Down here, very exciting never seen it before <laughs> um, today we are going to I'm gonna start by setting up a project because I haven't done that in the stream for a while and I will talk all about the stack uh, thank you d3 Valio for being with me um, I guess I can answer the question the stack is just basically a database in uh, Google Cloud I ran the simulation from a virtual instance in the last stream. Today, I'm gonna to set up a local project, which is what I'm about to do, and it's just some Python you know, running against that database instance. So I don't know if you can call that a stack exactly. <laughs> uh, it's sort of, but <laughs> yeah, but that's what we've got. So let's see, I'm gonna start from scratch kind of like the way I do it. So if I were starting over and, and making a project for this, I would say, uh, let's see, I want to, hmm, actually, I want to actually clone in SSH. I think I need to like sign in or something. GitHub CLI, GitHub desktop. Well, I can always just download it. Maybe I should just download the zip because usually I clone with SSH and I'm actually not seeing that option. How embarrassing that I didn't prepare this before diving into a stream. Um, why am I not seeing clone with SSH? It might be because I'm not signed in. I'm gonna, well, I'll save you that and I'll just like download it. And I will find my zip the old fashioned way. Let's see, in my downloads. Well, as you can see, I've kind of downloaded this before. I'll put it uh, under my churn folder where I probably have another copy of this already. See, here's this old one. Let's just get rid of that one. And so I'm gonna now make a new project in PyCharm, which is my preferred IDE. I'm just gonna say, I'm Everyone has their own preferred way of doing these things, and I'm just gonna show you mine. So let's see. I need to find what I just downloaded, Fight Churn Master, open it up. Um, I'll make a new virtual environment, and now I should just be ready to say, create the project, and create from existing sources. Fortunately, it's opening up in another screen. Here we go. Now, I haven't actually done this for a while, so I'm trying to remind myself. Um, setting up a new virtual environment in PyCharm. This is one of those other things I should have re rehearsed before saying I was going to do this on a live stream. But, you know, all about winging it. So I think I have to go in here and get to my project check what it says for a python interpreter i think this is actually good i think it's made me a new interpreter already so i think i just now need to install the requirements if i recall correctly it's pip install minus r requirements dot text and if you're i could actually mention that on my site I actually have uh, instructions for setting this up if you're not familiar with setup for the first time um, 
in this case, I would be going to the developer's you know, IDE setup instructions. But anyway, let's just see if I have this right. <laughs> Hit return and let it start installing some stuff. Okay, so that was the, the setup we were going to do. Um, and I'm gonna let those in requirements install for a bit. And while that's happening, we can get back to some talking. I'm gonna talk about, well, what is churn? You know, what are we here to talk about? For those of you who haven't known or heard it before, churn is subscribers, customers, or users who quit or cancel or unsubscribe or unfollow from your service or product, whatever it happens to be. The origin of the term is from the churn rate, which is what today's live stream is going to be all about. Uh, the churn rate means the percent of customers that drop out, but as you'll see, there's actually a lot of different ways to describe the percent of customers who drop out. But churn is now also a verb. You can say the customer churns, or I'm going to churn from Hulu because I'm sick of all their shows. You know, you can use it in a sentence like that. You can also make it a noun and say, make a report of last quarter's churns, or even describe a customer as a churn and say like, that customer, they're a churn because, um, you know, they canceled their subscription. So that's what churn is. Uh, what is Fighting Churn with Data? That's my book based on the time I spent as chief data scientist at Zora. Um, you can get the book at manning.com books, uh, Fighting Churn with Data. And there's a discount code here. If you actually don't have the book and want to purchase it, definitely use that discount code. Um, it'll let my pu publisher know that you saw this on the stream. Um, I'm no longer actually the, the chief data scientist at Zora. If you know, know me or see my career progression on uh, LinkedIn, it's been a while since I've been at Zora. It's been a couple years now, time flies. Um, I'm currently the head of data science at a company called OfferFit, which is also you know doing work in this sort of churn space, more like customer lifestyle met life cycle management um, and it's an extension of the techniques described in the book but we're using reinforcement learning to pick next best actions for customers but anyway i'm not here to talk about offer fit but you know hit me up in chat if you want to hear more about it later let's go on and talk about what is fighting churn with data really it really means data driven churn reduction which has a variety of um a variety of forms uh, thanks, D3 Valio, if I'm saying your name, uh, anything cor close to correct. I, I do think it's pretty exciting stuff, which is why I'm here to talk about it. Anyway, so one way to reduce churn with data is to make a great product by making features and content that customers love by, um, you know, using your data to figure out what they love rather than surveys, which are biased. Another way to reduced churn is with targeted marketing that's a lot kind of like the offer fit approach of using ai targeted engagement campaigns and also um, customer success and support is like giving customers help to use the product which you can target by using data to figure out which customers are not using certain features for example and lastly you've got your sales and pricing where you want to give customers the right size plan um, I used to say no discounts. I actually should update my deck because now at OfferFit, our strategy is if you use discounts, you've got to use machine learning to target them. Um, don't just throw out discounts to everyone who says they're going to cancel. That's really the advice. It's not no discounts, but only targeted discounts. Okay, so those are main ways to reduce churn with data. Why learn about this? Well, number one, I say this is the most common data science problem in the world because every company in the world nowadays has to deal with churn because they all want recurring revenue from their customers. Um, but there are some special techniques for churn which are not common to other data science uh, uh, types of problems. And it is also just a very general way to build good data science foundations. And in the live stream here, uh, I go from raw data to actual you know, usable results. 
Um, so hopefully you'll find it interesting, useful, maybe a little bit entertaining sometimes in my better moments. But so let's see. Without further ado, let's dive right in. Today's stream is supposed to be about, be about the top five turn rates with SQL. Well, you'll have to be the judge. Do I if it's four or five or six turn rates? There's going to be a bunch of different stuff. Um, so. First of all, let's talk about the data. I, I hate going away from something, some actual code or data for too long. I've been talking for too long without looking at any data. So let's look at the data um, that we're gonna be using. First, there is a CRM, which means Customer Relationship Management System, CRM, and it's a simulation. This is all simulated data because real data is hard to come by. It's hard to live stream, you know, some company's data. So that's why I use simulations to go through these concepts and techniques. So where's the data? Let me get over to a SQL query. Um, so I have already set up my uh, this SQL brow tool to point to um, my projects, uh, my database rather. So I'm going to set it to the CRM schema and we'll just select some data from the subscription table, which hopefully you can see this. Let me make this. Oh, there's the thing. On. Why don't make you let this bigger? There we go. So here is the subscription data that we have um, for the CRM simulation. You can see there's every row has an account ID, which is how we identify the customer account associated with the subscription. Um, you can see there's a product. We've got premier monthly, basic monthly. Um, later on, we can see some, uh, I think I saw an annual plan meetings and is a add-on product, an add-on subscription. So you can see in the CRM data, there's a variety of types of subscriptions. Um, every subscription has a start date and an end date. Um, it has an MRR, which is the monthly recurring revenue. If you don't know that term, that's a good one to know. It's your uh, subscription service lingo. It's usually called MRR, although now I've also heard it called RMR for recurring monthly revenue rather than monthly recurring revenue. But it, same thing. Um, these subscriptions also have quantities and units associated with them. So your standard subscriptions, like the advanced monthly plan, is associated with 50 user allowance. Um, and we're not seeing, there could be discounts, but we're not seeing any discounts here. And there can also be different billing periods. Uh, let's see, if we find one of those non-monthly plans, maybe I'd better get some more rows in here. Um, let's, and I'm going to order by descending account ID because I know in the first month of the simulation there's actually not a lot of, whoops, got my limit in the wrong place now, live streaming errors. Um, in the first month of the simulation there's actually less variety in the plan. So if we look later in the simulation you'll see it gets up to 2023 to 2024. Um, simulating a bit into the future here and we can see here's a biannual plan and it has a six month billing period and here we found someone uh, with a discount so this is all the simulated data in the new uh, CRM simulation there's a variety of plans with different numbers of users now if you're familiar with the book fighting term with data um, Oh, good question, D3 Leo. Fighting turn is tricky for non-subscription models. And yes, we will do a demo of a non-subscription uh, churn calculation. Although I'm sorry to say we are going to focus mostly on subscription because uh, that's where kind of the concept originated and where it's most commonly applied. But so... Yes, we will see non-subscription uh, in, in the stream, and I'll explain that in just a minute. I will just briefly now mention the old simulation from the book. This is actually what you'll see described in Fighting Turn with Data. It's a simple, simplified social network simulation, although it's imagining a paid social network. Uh, so actually, it's like the new X where you have to pay to use it. Like when I created this, there was no such thing as like a pay to use social network, but I just sort of made it up for it. It's just a simulation, of course, just to teach concepts from the book. Um, but so in this subscription data, you can actually see all the um, all of the the subscriptions are the same. 
uh, they're all basic and they have the same MRR and billing period and stuff like that. Although I'm actually wondering why are there only a hundred 160 accounts. I think I've actually not done a good job simulating setting up this data. All right, well, we'll deal with that later. We're going to look at some sample churn rate calculations. Uh, like I was saying, so we have two sources of data here to, to view, and we're going to run our calculations against them. First, let's talk briefly about the mental model of churn, uh, which is shown here in this illustration. Um, the circles represent your com the company's customer base at different points in time. So the top circle is meant to be your start customers um, or your starting revenue. And then the bottom circle is meant to represent after some time has passed, how many customers or revenue from customers do you have left at the end? So the the different uh, kind of intersections of the circle, whoops, show you the different um, concepts related to churn. So these pe this top slice here, the, the left behind customers or revenue, that's actually your churn. Um, the intersection between your starting and your ending customers is retention. And then logically, you know, whatever new customers you've picked up, that's your customer acquisitions. Um, and we're not going to talk too much about acquisition. We're going to talk a lot about churn and retention, but also this is a great diagram to illustrate that churn and retention are two measures that are intimately related. Uh, so churn plus retention together have to equal 100% of your customer base. And that's simple mathematically. Churn plus retention equals 100%. It also means that if you know retention, you can calculate churn as 100% minus churn. And if you know churn, you can calculate, or if you know ra rather, I think I got that backwards. <laughs> if you know churn, you can calculate retention. Or if you know retention, you can calculate churn. Either way. Um, you're good because it's just a simple mathematical relationship. So now the interesting thing is this is a great concept. How are we going to calculate it? Um, and here is now the stream plan. We're going to go over different ways to calculate churn. Um, the first one is retention. And like I said, that's actually a, a way of calculating churn because you can always calculate your churn as 100% uh, minus your retention. Then we'll go through the standard customer churn calculation, uh, which is based on the number of customers. And after that, we'll go through a calculation appropriate for enterprise software, which is revenue churn. And then uh, D3 Valeo is what I call activity churn, which is basing churn off of the behavior of your customers without looking at their churn contracts. Um, which I should mention, there's data in that database about not just subscriptions, but the actions of the customers. Uh, and I'll show that later, I guess, when we get to that part. Um, then after those, those are like your four basic methods of calculating churn. And then there's two extra areas I'll go over, which is converting churn time periods. And then um, what I'm calling the bonus is multi-period churn calculation. That's something I've never demoed in a live stream before. It's something I added to the code base after the release of Fighting Churn with Data. But so yeah, so without further ado, um, let's see. Let's talk about net retention. So net retention, as I illustrated in the diagram, is the what's left over from your starting customers after um, the time has passed. Now, this net retention is also generally calculated in terms of revenue. You could calculate net retention in terms of the number of customers in principle, but no one does it. So we're going to look at the way people really do it, which is you have a starting amount of revenue from the customers. That's illustrated here. Suppose this is your five customers on January 1st, and you have a total of $89.95 in revenue from these customers. And then you go fast forward to some other point in time and you look at what revenue is remaining 
from the revenue that you had at the start. So in this simple example, in this one month, um, we've lost one customer, customer two actually churned, they're gone, bye-bye, sorry to lose you customer two. Um, we, we've also gained customers six and seven, that's nice. Um, but note that the customers we gain don't factor into the net retention calculation. So the, our, let's see, revenue from our starting customers at the end is act now only 7996 because we lost this customer. Oh, he was a premier customer too. Customer two was our premier customer, 2999 revenue loss. And so you can see the net retention rate is the revenue retained 7996 divided by the revenue that we had at the start 89.95. So in this toy problem, we had 89% uh, net retention. Okay, now that's all well and good, but we, you know, we are not dealing with a toy problem. We're dealing with a real subscription churn problem. Um, good question, Deep Leo. What if a customer downgrades their plan? The revenue would be lower, and so the absolute number of users would be the same, but you would still have churn. So definitely in this, in a revenue-based churn, um, downgrades ca count against you. The other interesting, there's a flip side of that, which we're gonna talk about. You're kind of getting ahead of the stream here, but upgrades also count. So if you upgrade, if a customer upgrades to a higher plan, that also goes into um, your net retention. And I think I'm gonna say that in another slide. What do we do first? Talk, more talk or calculation? Let's do calculation first, um, then more talk. So let's see, let's see what happened in my IDE here. Okay, it looks like I've successfully installed a project. Um, and now, since this is my first time here, I'm gonna have to add a configuration. Boy, shoot, I, I forgot I had to demo all this setup, but I wanted to demo the setup because I haven't set demoed this setup in a while. So for people who've seen this before, bear with me. Um, let's see, what's the most efficient way to do this? I need to add a configuration, um, which I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna add a new Python configuration and the script is in the uh, fight churn, uh, it's this one, uh, see, run churn listing. And the next thing I have to do is set some environment variables. So I'm gonna do like the easy way, which is going back to my own instructions <laughs> and find the environment variables that I need to set up. Here we go, so now I can, um, copy paste these in while I add these environment variables. Just what I think it's safe to say that and I won't redo this in future streams, by the way. I actually don't do this every time. It's just that I haven't done it for a while. So my churn database happens to have the name churn. And what's my next variable? Uh, my churn db user. Oh shoot, I think in this case, it's actually like Postgres. Uh, I, I just, oh no, wait, that's not what I need. Sorry. Turn TV user, this one I think is Postgres because I never created anything other than the default user. Um, what's next? I need my password. And that one is just churn. It's not very secure, but who cares? It's just simulated data. And I need to set up a, an output directory. Um, let's see, which means I should make an output directory. I'll make a new folder, whoops. Here, no wait, that's not, I need to do, is it? Stream output now. Let's see. I need to copy this. Uh, I'm just going to quickly copy paste that. So, and I need actually one other um, one other parameter. It's a uh, let's see. It's 
the IP address of my database. It's actually not shown here because here I'm just showing um, the basic setup. Now, how am I going to remember? God, I can't even remember what my own parameter is. But let me just look for it in the code. It shouldn't be too hard to find it because I don't know. You'd think I would remember this because I wrote it, but you know, that's just not the way life actually works. Let's see. If I do set churn environment, this is what I would be running. Oh, it's churn db host. This is just me checking this. So now I need to have my environment variable. Uh, one more, and I promise this will be the last one. And then, I, then we're actually going to run code. Come on, PyCharm, just start working. Why is that not working? There we go. One more environment variable, churn db host. Now I showed you that Google Cloud is running in the background somewhere. Now I'm actually going to have to use it. Let's get this IP address going. Put that in here. And don't bother trying to use that IP address. It's got a firewall. So anyway, that was, that's kind of obvious. OK, so I think I'm actually set up. And I need to enter the parameters, which is chapter two, and listing refers to the listing numbers in the book. Uh, and I think this is chapter two, listing one. Yeah, it's the very first one, of course. So we are going to try to run that in just a second. Although first, actually, let's look at the code. Uh, why did I make this so small? Where did my project window go? Here we go. Okay, so in listings, let's finally look at the code. This is uh, listing 2.1 from the book, which is net retention. So this is how we're actually going to calculate it. And looking at this, let's remember the picture I made of the two circles, where uh, going back to my the mental model diagram, here. Retention is what's retained, you know, between two different points in time. And so we're actually in the SQL query going to calculate um, the customers at each different point in time using a common table expression. Hey, imaginable gank. I love your uh, Twitch username. Um, Oh, you're asking a promotion for my users. No, that is actually is bothering me. So please don't um, promote anything or I'm going to have to uh, look up how to mute you. <laughs> Let's see. So this is bothering me. Uh, Okay, I think I blocked that person. <laughs> I'm not an expert at this. But anyway, back to explaining, uh, ignoring imaginable Jenks, um, whatever it is. Uh, let's go back to the uh, calculation here. So what I do is I use common table expressions to actually calculate the accounts and their MRR at the beginning and end of a time period. And I have a little CTE, which is common table expression, which gives the start date and end date. Um, and these bind variables are actually plugged in from the code, from the, the fighting churn with data project. So this is a SQL. And somewhere else in the, you know, the, the repo, there's a function that's going to run this SQL and plug in these start and end dates. So I do one select start accounts, which are those subscriptions where the start date of the subscription is less than or equal to the start date of my calculation. That's, you know, this start date. Or, and the end date of the subscription should be greater than uh, the calculation start date. Or you could have no end date. That's actually another way of storing subscriptions. Um, so let's see. Uh, 
Um, then the ending account is actually the same thing. We have the accounts and their total MRR uh, grouping by accounts. Now the start date of the subscription should be less than or equal to the end date of the calculation. So basically you tell if a subscription is active if, by if its start or end date span a certain point in the calculation. In the first CTE, it's the start date of the calculation and the last CTE is the end date. I sort of overuse the, the word start date and end date and it does make this a little bit hard to read, I have to admit, now that I'm looking at it again. Um, but so we have the start accounts and the end accounts and the actual churn calculation is a retained uh, is another CTE, the retained accounts, and this is just start accounts interjoin the ending accounts. So how do you know if a customer is retained? It's, well, it's got to be the same customer. So that's an interjoin, simple SQL calculation. So having calculated the retained accounts, it's also very easy to calculate our net retention. Um, we do, we can select the total starting MRR, the total, this is actually not exactly the ending MRR, this is the retained MRR, which is the key thing about it. Um, and then the, the retention rate is retained MRR over start MRR, and you can also do like a, a net uh, MRR churn rate. So now, this is the SQL that's saved in a folder of the repo. I should be able to run this by running the churn calculation. Let's see if I get this right. There's also actually a schema param. Let's try schema, the social net seven schema first. Let's see if I've set everything up right. Moment of truth here. Have I set everything up right that this will actually run? Uh, yeah, okay, it worked. So when you run this from the repo, it'll first print out the SQL that you're actually running. So I mentioned that there's binding variables here. So I've actually set in uh, March 1st, 2020 to April 1st, 2020, which is the old simulation date range. Um, and then it prints out the results, which is that the net retention is 0 0.94 uh, and the net MRR based churn rate calculation is 5.4 and you can also here see you can see it also prints out these intermediate quantities which is the starting MRR uh, and the retained MRR so that is uh, yeah so that is the net retention calculation in SQL let's see do variables work in BigQuery's favorite flavor of SQL I'm actually not sure because in this case the variables are put are pasted in in the Python. Um, and also, I should mention, uh, we're not using BigQuery. I don't know if you, if you, I mentioned the fine print, we're actually in Postgres land here. Where do we see that actually? Somewhere it should say that this is a Postgres instance. I'm not really seeing it. Maybe on the, if I go back here. Yeah, here, I, I'm on Postgres SQL 15. Um, but it's the same thing, like Postgres doesn't handle those barn variables. I handle them in the Python. And um, in my day job, we do use BigQuery all the time. Um, but there we also generally um, put in our variables uh, in our code and then send them to BigQuery. Um, so let's now try the other churn calculation, uh, which is on the CRM data schema. This is the customer relationship management schema. Uh, and we'll try this one. That's all working. Now here, what we've actually got is hmm, net MR retention rate. It's actually just a little bit greater than one. Um, that's interesting because I mentioned earlier that there can be upgrades um, of customers who you know upgrade their plan. And there can also be downgrades, and both of those go into net retention. But here, so here we've actually got a negative net MRR churn rate. It's actually not very negative. I was expecting this to be more negative. I'm gonna try running a different month. What month was this for? Here it was running 2023 April 1st to 2023 May 1st. And I'm gonna dive into the guts of the, how this project is set up here. 
if I go in to my, <clears throat> my listing configuration, this is all detailed in the online uh, documentation too. Um, these are where I've configured my listings and I've set these calculations here. Um, oh, it looks like I have another month set up as, as V2. So this was, this was the first month I set up. So let's just try another month. And I would do that in this case by going dash dash version two. I wanna see what the net retention is in another month. Cause usually it was higher in this simulation. Hmm, still only 1.004. Okay, well, I'm not gonna like belabor that point, but the point is you can actually have a net retention um, that's greater than one. And that leads you to have uh, what they call negative churn. I think I've got some slides about this next. So back to the talk track. That was our net retention toy problem. This was uh, me introducing the, the, the calculation. So let's talk a little bit about the uses. What is net retention good for? Um, it's easy to calculate. That's the first nice thing about it because it's just a, like that inner join. Um, you just take the customers that you had at the start and you know see which ones survive to the end and then you know add up the revenues. Um, also, if all of your customers pay, pay one price or if your service is free, um, then churn is 100% minus net retention. However, as we mentioned, if you have multiple prices, you can have this scenario where upsell cancels your churn. Um, and that kind of hides the churn, um, like in this case, like, because if you look at this calculation here, do you really believe the churn rate is negative? Or, you know, you don't even know what the churn rate is in this calculation. <clears throat> so hiding the churn is actually kind of bad when what you're trying to do is, um, um, you know, analyze your churn. So I don't really recommend net retention for analyzing your churn or trying to reduce your churn, but it has some good things about it. One is that investors like net retention. Why do investors like net retention? Um, because when you include the upsells and, and downsells in the number, it actually summarizes how the business will grow or decline if you didn't make any new sales, which is actually interesting if you think about it. What would happen to your company if you made no new sales and just cruised with your current customers? That's actually what your net retention will tell you. So investors actually really like this number because it's kind of a good summary business metric there. And companies also like to communicate net retention too. Why? They actually like it because it hides their churn. <laughs> um, you can even show that you have no churn or negative churn with net retention. So yeah, so that's kind of the summary of what you do with net retention. So um, yeah, unless anyone has any other further questions about net retention, we're gonna kind of come back to comparing it later. But I will go on to the next churn rate calculation, which is the customer churn or standard churn. Now this is a customer churn toy problem. So customer churn works similarly to net retention, but now you're gonna look at the customers who churned divided by the number of customers that were there at the start. So this is again, simple toy problem. At, in our first month, we have five customers, one, two, three, four, five. I'm not showing what they pay because it doesn't matter for standard churn. We lose one customer, we gain two customers again. And what is our churn rate? It is the number of customers who churned one, divided by the number of customers at the start, five. So this scenario, we have a 20% churn rate. Now you might ask, what about my two new customers? They don't count actually. They're not part of churn. That's part of your uh, acquisition, which is a function of sales and marketing. So it's just kind of separate. It's a separate question from churn. I mean, obviously you need to be acquiring new customers and if you're not, you have problems, but you don't really consider that with churn. So that is how you do a standard uh, churn calculation in um, a toy problem. Now, what do you do if you have a big database with lots of customers? Um, we said that retention was an inner join uh, between the account at two different times. So logically you would have um, 
an outer join, which will give you your churn. Uh, wait, question from d 3 Leo. Another curveball. We like curveballs. What if the new acquisitions are last lapsed customers that subscribed again? That um, still counts as acquisition. Although it does get complicated. There are a lot of very cyclical businesses. It's actually a real, I go actually go through this curveball all the time because we at we work with, I work with companies that have very cyclical businesses and you have customers, especially in streaming. Streaming is the worst for this. Why? Because we all cancel and then resubscribe. Well, not everyone. A lot of people cancel and then resubscribe streaming services. In a, in a standard streaming service like Netflix, people might cancel when a season, when they've watched the whole season, and then they cancel, and then when the new season starts, that person signs up again. Um, in sports streaming, you have seasons of sports, and you will definitely have people who sign up for a sports streaming service for their favorite sport, and then at the end of the season, they cancel. And then the next year, they come back again. So churn actually becomes really hard to think about uh, in those situations. And in truth, there's actually not an industry standard. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've, yeah, you, you, some of the ways to look at it is you, you end up starting to, for individual customers, measuring the, the probability that they're going to come back again, but you never know is the thing. So when a customer leaves, you still consider it a churn. And when they come back, you consider it an acquisition, but at the same time, you're analyzing the cyclicality of your business, both at the macro level of knowing what of what are your seasons and even at the individual customer customer level. And if you do uh, modeling, you can model the probability that an individual customer is going to sign up again the next time their favorite season starts. So we do all of those things um, in, in, the, in, the, in the, the trenches, in the ugly real world war against churn. But let's continue with this simplified world of uh, SaaS. Uh, simple kind of SaaS businesses where just kind of imagine the world is in a steady state and you don't have seasonality or cyclicality. We're going to calculate churns with a left outer join uh, on end account and start account. Let's see. Oh, and also I mentioned you could calculate acquisitions with a right outer join, uh, which we're not actually going to do today, but that's just an interesting note to solve. So now let's look at listing 2.2. Um, in the same way we did before, we will first take a quick look at the code, um, see that we know what it's doing. So in this case, I again form two common table expressions with a starting and ending accounts. Uh, in this case, I'm just selecting account IDs and I'm using distinct because as you saw, in the CRM simulation data, you can definitely have multi subscriptions per account. Um, and so for churn, you know, we kind of assume it's if they have any, if they keep any subscription, they stay subscribed. That's another interesting one. So this measure is going to ignore downgrades. Like someone could have had multiple product subscriptions. They might downgrade to only one, but in this case, we would still count that as they stayed subscribed. So again, we find if someone is subscribed by checking if the subscription start date is less than equal the analysis start date and the subscription end date is greater than the analysis end date or analysis start date. Oh God, these terminologies get me. Or the subscription end date could be null. Um, for the ending accounts, it's the same calculation where the we're checking that the subscription start date is less than the calculation end date subscription end date greater than calculation end date oh my god it's like a tongue twister uh, i should have thought of that when i wrote this code the first time now here is the promised outer join your churned accounts are the accounts from the you start with all the accounts in the start accounts you left outer join um, on the end accounts. And that means that if there is no subscription in the end uh, account CTE, you'll get a null. 
Um, and then we select just those rows where the account ID um, is null, and that gives us the dropped accounts. This is actually harder to do in Microsoft Excel. Net retention you can do in Microsoft Excel, I'm pretty sure, with like a VLOOKUP or something. Uh, churn is harder to do if you're not using SQL, but if you know SQL and you know outer joins, it's incredibly easy to do. So now we just do the calculation. We count the number of customers at the start and we count the number that churned and put them all into a calculation, uh, casting to float here because those are integers and we need the churn rate to end up as a float. So that is how it's done. Let's do the churn calculation. Um, let's see. Let's call this what net retention calc. Now let's make a standard churn calc. So this is actually going to be chapter two, listing two. Uh, just go back to the same basic version. And let's see. So this will be for the CRM simulation. Once again, um, it plugs in these start and end dates, April to May 2023. Um, runs through the SQL. In this case, we had 59 churns and 2,700 uh, at the start. And that gives us a churn rate of 0.02 and a retention rate of 0.97. Now, if we compare that again, we can go back to the net, ret the net retention calc um, for that same one. And you can see that uh, we had greater than one net retention, but indeed our actual uh, standard churn retention is just, uh, well, 98%. That's still fairly good, but you know, it's not 100. <laughs> now, if we go to the social network simulation, I'll just edit this one, go back to social net seven. Here, it'll run through the same calculation. That gives us a 5.4% churn rate. And because in the, the, the social network simulation, as I mentioned, there's only one price. Let's go back to this one. In this one, we should have also, the net retention rate should be very similar. Whoops, what did I do wrong? Do, 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 process finished. Made some kind of typo in here. So, oh, there we go. Social Netty 7. That was not one of the options. All right, so here we have our net retention calculated churn rate is basically exactly the same as the standard churn calculation return rate. So that is the, the difference between enterprise software and simple you know, user uh, products. So simple products, net retention can substitute for the churn rate, but in the, uh, in the, in a multi-tiered product with different levels of subscription, um, the net retention is not gonna line up with your standard churn rate. So, unless anyone else has any questions on that, I will go back to the talk track. Ah, this mug is slowing my coffee intake by too much. Very important for live streaming, coffee. So let's talk about the standard churn rate. It does not reflect upsell and downsell, which is good sometimes, bad other times. So it's good to ignore price dis differences, which is a good thing about ignoring price changes when you use transient discounts, for example. Because for example, if you did give out discounts, it could look like churn. But that's not really what you want. Um, also, if you have just a few prices that are not too far apart, like let's, you know, then you might want to ignore, you know, those price differences. On the other hand, if you have a wide range of prices, like in enterprise software, um, a high price can be like 100x a low price for a product. For, you know, like if you're a small company using like Salesforce, they might charge you, you know, 10,000 a year. But if you're a big company, it's gonna be like a million. <laughs> so from sales, a big companies, from the enterprise software 
company's point of view, it's very important to take account of those price differences. So you shouldn't actually value all subscriptions equally uh, for enterprise software. And that is why we have revenue churn. Yes, revenue churn is the churn rate, which is like net retention, but it's more focused on churn. What is revenue churn? It is only counting churn and downsells. Um, and you make a ratio of your churn and your downsell to your starting revenue. So it's like net retention, but without the upsells. So it's kind of like a more punishing version of net retention. Um, yeah. So here is an illustrated toy problem of revenue churn. Again, we have our like five customers and let's say uh, in this scenario, we have one churn, customer two churns. We have one downgrade from Premier to uh, something. Actually, yeah, it still says Premier, but it's 999. So a little typo here. Ignore that Premier, focus on the 999. <laughs> and here we also have an upgrade. So suppose customer five goes from standard to Premier. So you have to do all the math, add up your starting and ending revenue. Once again, ignore the acquisitions. These two don't count into your revenue churn rate. Um, and let's see. So suppose we had $20 worth of downsell. That was this guy who cut 20, customer four, 20.99 to 9.99. We had 29.99 of churn, in this case, losing customer two. Our revenue at the start was 89.95. So in this case, the revenue churn, also MRR churn, becomes 56%. So that is the, the toy problem of revenue churn. And the real thing, of course, is to do this with our SQL database. Let's find the code. MRR churn, it's actually listing four. Um, and again, you're gonna get used to this very standard pattern. Um, once again, we're calculating the accounts at the start and their total MRR. This is like in the net retention calculation we already looked at. I'm not gonna do the tongue twister describing the condition <laughs> for a customer to be subscribed. But once again, we also have the end accounts and their total MRR um, using a group by because they might have multiple subscriptions. Once again, we have the churned accounts, just like in the standard churn calculation, but now we're also including their MRR, but we're doing the left outer join, remind you of that from earlier in the stream. That's the key to calculating your churned accounts, um, is left outer join on the account ID, but then you take those rows where the right side join table or the ending accounts have got a null in the join, meaning there was no record uh, for them in the end accounts. And that gives our churned MRR. Now we also need the downsell MRR, which is like the retention equation um, in that it's an inner join between start and end accounts on the account IG. But we only want down cells, which we defined as those where the total MRR uh, is reduced. And then what we're actually calculating here is the down cell amount, which is the, the start MRR minus uh, the end MRR. So that is how we get the down cell. Now the rest of this is just the arithmetic. You'll end up with a start MRR, the churned MRR and the downsell MRR. And we just put them all into um, a similar equation to the one we had, churn plus downsell divided by start. So let's try this out um, through my favorite method of duplicating uh, <laughs> these listings. This is gonna be listing four. Now, social net seven, we'll run through that one real quick. Remember, this is the one where everyone pays the same. So we should actually find that this is also 5.4%, just like uh, in, you know, just like the net retention churn and the standard churn. And the whole reason for existence of the 
the CRM simulation is we can actually see some differences. <laughs> um, so yeah, I basically, when I, when I wrote fighting term with data, you know, I didn't have enough time to make a really good simulation. So I did something kind of basic. The CRM is now, you know, the new, the new latest and greatest simulation. Cause you can actually explore these calculations and see that they give you different things. So let's see um, the MRR churn result for CRM five. Hmm, it actually turns out to be, let's see, 0.021. Um, and you can see there's there was $5,000 of downsell, uh, $40,000 of churn on a starting MRR of, oh, what's that, 2.2 million. Not a very good business, that CRM, but you know, I guess that's monthly, so maybe 2 million a month isn't too bad a business. Uh, so anyway, let's back to what was the original, um, go back and do the standard churn for the CRM simulation. I think it was a little bit higher. Let's double check this. So standard churn on the CRM simulation was hmm, 2.14. So it's actually not that different. Um, that's actually funny. I'm gonna have to double check this simulation run because in my older simulation runs, I had a bigger difference. This is actually pretty embarrassing. Uh, I wonder why. Well, we'll look into that more later, but at least they're somewhat different. So this one we had 2.1%, 2.14. So it's only about a 1% difference, the MRR churn and the standard churn, but that's monthly. So that's actually, you know, it adds up, trust me. So let's go back to the talk track. So this was, here's a little thing to a little going through the curveballs of the churn calculations mentally. In theory, you would think that revenue churn should be higher than customer churn, right? Why? Because revenue churn is most pessimistic. It includes downsell with the churn, but not upsell. You'd say standard churn is like kind of neutral um, because it ignores the amount the customers pay. And net retention is the most optimistic because it actually allows upsell to cancel churn. So that is the theory. Now, what's the reality actually that most customers, well, many companies find and most particularly enterprise software companies, but also even any company with multiple price points where the power users pay a higher price, um, the fact is that those who pay more usually churn less. Why? Because it's a self-selecting audience. Why are they paying more? Because they really like the product. Um, so actually, customer churn is usually greater than revenue churn. That's actually the real curveball that many people don't realize. And both of those are generally greater than net retention churn, which is the one that's logical because, you know, it makes sense that revenue churn you know, that, that net retention churn is the most optimistic because it still has the upsells. Um, you have, for really good companies, you have the net retention um, so good that you end up with negative churn. Um, which I think I'd say here. No, we actually don't say that, but that's, that's the real relationship. You can get negative churn from net retention and actually your customer churn will be higher than your revenue churn. Okay, now this is the subject actually that D3 Valio asked about ages ago. It was like, well, what do you do if you're not even a subscription product? Churn is definitely still relevant there, but you don't have a subscription with start and end dates. So what do you do? Well, you can just use the same kind of logic um, based on activity. Um, so let's say that, you know, you have the events for a customer. Um, they're using your product. Each one of these lines might be a day when they use the product. Um, so basically, if you see a short gap in their use of the product, maybe like a day or a week, you're not going to call that a churn. But let's say the customer just goes missing for months. You're going to call that a churn. And it's a very simple rule of thumb. You know, you say something like, if I haven't seen a customer for 90 days, I'm going to consider them to be a churn. And this can be used for retail as well as, um, you know, games that are free, um, free streaming services, things like that. 
Now, you always get into the mind fuck of what if they come back? You're like, what if I have a 90 day window and then I call them a churn and on the 91st day, you know, they come back, you know, and sign up again. Um, it happens and it's true. And so you kind of want to pick that window at a t at a range where it's not likely for them to come back. Um, and remember, you have the exact same problem in subscription churn. So someone coming back the next day after you counted them as a churn is also a problem for subscription products. Because what happens to a lot of people, um, they, their credit card expires and they forget to update it. So when that payment fails or maybe seven days after the payment failed, they're considered a churn. Um, but then what if they fix their credit card the next day? <laughs> Are they still a churn? <laughs> you just have to ignore the edge cases like that because <clears throat> there's kind of no way to win. So churn based on activity and inactivity is a pretty simple concept. Um, we'll go back now to listing two, three. Um, and look at that in SQL. Now I didn't mention this earlier, but there's also an event table. Um, we can look at that real quick. Let's go back to the SQL. Always love going back to SQL. Um, let's see, we'll do the CRM simulation. Let's see, do I have any event queries here? Not handy. I could just do um, select star from event and we can see some of the event data. It's actually not very interesting to look at. <laughs> Um, there's accounts and each event has a time and then there's an event type ID which actually tells you um, what the event was and in the CRM simulation we've even got individual users you've got uh, user IDs that go with it too um, and some of the events actually have uh, numerical values associated with them um, and yeah, that's basically what the events look like. Now, what are these events? Hmm, let me see if I can go back and find, um, I think I had uh, some event queries in my history. Let's find, looking for, looking for event queries, still not finding it. Well, what I can do, do you guys want me to look more at the events or should we get on with a churn query? Maybe I should just get on with a churn query. So there are events and each event type ID is a different type of action. And in the next stream where we talk about feature engineering uh, on the events, we'll look more at what those are. But just for now, the model is that customers take actions on the product um, and they wind up in this event database. Um, we have the same thing for the social network simulation. Um, and here there is a variety of events, uh, but you'll notice that the uh, user ID and the event values are not used in the old simulation in the book. So let's see. So what is the event um, churn query. It's actually, now that you've seen these other churn queries, it actually looks very, very similar. Now we look at the event table and look at everyone who had an event time that is within an interval. So we're going to take an activity interval, call it like, you know, 30 days. So we're going to say everyone who has had an action within 30 days of my start date was active on the start date. Let's say, I mean, it's actually not specified here what the interval was. So it could be a week if it's like um, a, a game that people download, you know, you might want to use a short window. Um, if it's like an online website or something, you might want to use a longer window. It's up to, it depends a lot on your business and I'm not going to go into the details. But so we'll say someone's active if their last event was within, was after the start, well, it, it was within the, the start date and an interval before the start date. It's the easiest way to describe it. And we'll have a count of users at the start, just like in any churn calculation. And then we're going to take um, people who have uh, an event within the end date and that interval before. So they have to have, their events have to be within the interval before the end date and the end date, and we'll call those the people who are active at the end. 
and then we'll just get a count from them. Now the churned account um, is actually going to be our familiar outer join. It's just like in the churn query on the start accounts and the end accounts, inner join by account ID, uh, select only those records where the account ID is null in the column from the end date, and that will give you the churned accounts, just like as if it were based on subscriptions. So you just use the activity as a guide to tell you um, if they were active or subscribed, well, whatever you want to call it, um, at that time. And then your churn calculation ends up being the same. Um, it's just the number churn divided by the number at the start. Um, and then you can do one minus that and it's a retention rate. So let's see, let's run this one. I will once again make a new copy call this activity churn. Um, so this will be listing three. Um, and generally this one should be, actually, I'm not even sure I have this set up. Let's see if this runs. Hmm, no listing for chapter two in CRM five. So actually, it's no listing for chapter two, three. Let's try this for social net seven. This should be set up. We should get the activity based churn. And remember, the churn rate was around 5.4% um, on this account. Now, what's the first thing we notice? It's taking longer. So, why does this take longer? Actually, this is a good thing to point out. There's a lot less data in the subscription table than the event table. So to do this query, we actually have to do these aggregations on the event data, which is simply more expensive. Um, a good way to speed it up if you're doing this in practice might be to look at only a single event. So that's a common extension of this, would be to um, limit this query to a specific event ID, which I didn't do, um, but you definitely could. Um, although you would have to have what if you have like a login event, that would be perfect, right? Because everyone who uses the product has to like log in or something like that. Although, yeah, no, that could work. I mean, without subscriptions, you might still log in, but or a home screen event, anything that they get every session would be the best way to go. It would be harder if you made a specific event that people don't have in every session. Um, but anyway, here once again, we got a churn rate very close to the other one, around five and a half percent. Now you notice I didn't actually have this set up for the CRM simulation. So I'll do a little quick demo of like um, setting things up in the fighting churn with data code because I actually had this listing file already. It's just a JSON which has the parameters uh, that for all the listings you want to run. And you can see here, I have an entry for listing one, I have an entry for listing two and listing four, but I actually uh, never put in one for listing three before now, because <laughs> when I developed the simulation, I was really more focused on um, the, the, the revenue churn and net retention because it's a CRM product that the people pay for. It doesn't really make sense that you would look at activity churn, but I'm just doing this now as a demonstration. So I changed this to listing three. Um, this has to be the correct name, which in this case is activity churn. Um, oh wait, so there was a question that I missed. End date wouldn't be used in this query. Is that right? Uh, ooh, I miss what that one, page view, etc. Yes, those are definitely page views would be a good event, you know, to use for the activity churn. Um, but end date, uh, D3 Valio, I'm not sure which end date you were referring to. I was so busy talking that I, sorry, I missed that question. Um, but so this was what I would have to do to set up the activity churn in a new uh, simulation. Um, and this actually might take a long time because the CRM simulation actually has a lot of events in the table. Oh no, wait, something's wrong. Oh, I need another parameter, max inactive. Oh, okay, I have to set this parameter. So that's why I'm failing. Let's see, I don't need a from date, but I do need this parameter, max inactive, uh, I guess 30, 30 days sound good. Let me just double check. 
looking at the social net seven listings what did i have for this i said one month hmm, actually i like that better let's go with that and what's not happy here i guess jason doesn't like the trailing commas uh, Okay, let's see if now I can run listing three on the social network. Okay, I mean on the CRM rather. Okay, that's running. Now this actually might take a little while because as I mentioned, there's a lot of events in that CRM. Oh, okay. And I'm glad to see I cleared up the end date uh, question. Cool. All right, well, let's press ahead then. I'm not gonna sit here and wait for this because there's a lot of events in that table. I know for a fact. <laughs> so let's go on to the next part. Okay, those were the four basic um, churn calculations. So I said this is the top five churn calculations. A little bit of uh, marketing there, you know, it has to be the top five. But there are four top churn calculations and then there's variations. So one of the important variations is time period conversion. So the first question is, is annual churn 12 times monthly churn? Well, the answer is a little bit complicated. The simple answer is yes and no, <laughs> but basically no, <laughs> not exactly. <laughs> How about that? Let's talk about annual churn and monthly churn and through a survival problem. I don't know if this is gonna make it more complicated than it needs to be, but churn is like a survival problem in mathematics, if you've ever heard of that. And what that means is if you have a churn rate, you're going to lose that percentage every month. And if you go through the math, you see that you have to do some exponents. So in the suppose you have 100 customers in the first month, 10% churn, you lose 10 and then you have 90 left or 100 times 0.9, 100 times your retention rate. So you start with 90 in month two, and then you also have 10% churn in month two. So actually you lose nine in month two, because remember churn is a rate and we're imagining the churn rate is constant um, depend without regard to the number of customers that you have. And that's a realistic assumption too, generally. Unless your service gets into a death spiral, then the fewer users you get, you know, your churn rate might pick up. But let's assume your churn rate stays constant um, over the course of a year. So at the end of month two, you only have 81, which coincidentally, or not coincidentally, is 100 times 0.9 squared, which is your retention rate squared. Going on to month three, you're coming in with 81 customers, you lose 10% of them, eight, and you're left with 73, which not coincidentally is 100 times 0.9 cubed, your retention rate cubed. So you're probably seeing the pattern here that if you went out 12 months and you want to know how many customers would be left after 12 months, this is actually assuming only churn and no new signups. So just remember, we're not assuming no new signups here, uh, which you, you would hopefully have if this was really your service. Um, in month 12, you get 100 times 0.9 to the 12th would be what you'd have left to get uh, 28 apparently. So this is putting it into equations here. And you can see at the end of month one, you have your start number times your retention rate. At the end of month two, you end up with the num start number times retention squared, etc., etc. After 12 months, you have the starting number times your monthly retention rate to the 12th. Okay, so now for those of you who don't like equations and math, this next part will make you uncomfortable. So this is like trigger warning. If you have, if you get triggered by math equations, this is a good point to you know stop watching. Um, so monthly year churn scaling, the retention in one year is going to be retention in one month to the twelfth. So churn in one year will be 100% minus retention in one year. That was shown very early in the stream, that churn is 100% minus retention. So if we fill in this math, um, churn is 100% minus one month retention to the 12th. And now the final curveball in the equation is 
churn in one year is 100% minus, well, what's retention in one month? It's 100% minus churn in one month to the 12th. So churn one year is one minus, one minus churn in a month to the 12th. So that is actually the full equation of month to year churn scaling. Now you can also do this in precisely reverse, um, which I won't go through the details, but you can also say your churn in one month is one minus, and the quantity, one minus churn in one year, but now we take the power to the one twelfth. Um, so that is, you know, the, the, the hardest math we're gonna look at today. Actually, that's not quite true. I think the next slide, the math might be even worse. Um, so this is, oh, here's my quote. <laughs> that's the 12th root, just to make it clear, um, to get monthly churn from annual churn. Um, now, you can also do this for arbitra any arbitrary time period. So churn in one year is one minus, again, quantity, 100% minus churn in any number of days. So let's say you measure your churn rate over 37 days, or I don't know, that would be weird. Maybe 90 days. You could do 90 days. That would be reasonable, like your quarterly churn number. And then you would make this exponent 365 over n. And that would give you your one year churn based on a churn rate measured in any arbitrary number of days. Example, here we go. So let's say, well, here I said 60 days. So churn in one year is one minus, one minus churn in 60 days to the 6.1. Hmm. Churn in one month, uh, well, I already made that example. So let's say, oh, so here this is a, say we want one month churn from 90 day churn. Okay, that's a good example. Uh, one minus, one minus churn in 90 days to the one third. Because you, again, you're going from a longer time period to a shorter time period, you're gonna be taking a root. And if you're going from a shorter time period to a longer time period, you're gonna be taking an exponent. Okay, so that is the end of the math. Let's, well, in on the slide, let's look at it in some code. Uh, going back to chapter two, uh, listing five. So this one is called uh, churn rate scales. And here you basically put in any start and end date. That's actually what's getting fun here. Well, if you consider this fun. <laughs> Uh, so you'll have a start date and an end date. These can be arbitrary. And we're gonna do the exact same thing we, we did in the previous calculations. We have a start account uh, common table expression with all the accounts that were active based on their subscriptions at the start date. And then we also have an end account table defined in the same way, but this is the end date of our calculation. So D was our, is our date range. Uh, defined here in the first common table expression. All right, we still calculate our churned accounts in the usual way um, with a left outer join, uh, end accounts, start accounts, left outer join, end accounts, take those where the end accounts had a null account ID in the join, uh, which means they had no record in the end account table. And as usual, we'll take our start count and our churn count. So this is all exactly like the standard churn calculation that I showed earlier. But now we're gonna throw in the crazy math that I just went through, if you consider this crazy. So first we're gonna have end date minus start date. We'll call that the period in days. And now we have to do that whole equation. So the churn, the annual churn based on this is one minus, as, as I mentioned, a quantity uh, one minus churn. So this is our, this is our monthly, well, this is our retention rate calculated over this number of days, however it, it, many it is. And then the annual churn, churn, we take that to the power 365 divided by uh, the, the period, end date minus start date. So that gives us the annual churn. And then we can also do um, the monthly churn using the other equation. One minus quantity to the power, uh, you know, it's monthly retention calculated here. Or, well, retention, not monthly, of your time period to the 365 over 12. And that gives us uh, 
the the monthly churn. So there's an example set up of this again for the well, actually wait we never checked did this okay the activity churn rate calculation for the CRM five simulation did complete. I should have put in like a start time end time in this printout so we could see how long it took. We weren't watching, but it did actually complete uh, 1.7%. <clears throat> And let's see. Hello, first time chatter, Z270F6. Hmm, does that mean something? That is very interesting. <clears throat> but I'm happy to have a first time chat from someone who's not trying to sell us anything or spam us anything. Uh, so let's see. So let's run the scaled churn rate code once again by copying this. Let's just call this, well, scaled churn. It's going to be my new listing. I think it was five. I'm going to do this with social net seven because I don't think I have the other one set up. And let's try running the scaled churn rate. Oh, you're from France. Except isn't it really late there? Wow, you are up late on Twitch and you stumbled into a, a, a data coding stream. Sorry for you. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so here we have the start at the end. The, the number at the start is 10,000. The number that churn is 1,200. What I call the measured churn rate is the, ch the, the percentage churn in this 92 days. But then based on these calculations, you can see it printed out again here, the annual churn rate is actually 39%, whereas the monthly churn rate is 4%. So that's an illustration of the uh, scaled churn rate for annual and monthly. And once again, demoing, uh, updating these configurations. I don't think I have listing five configured in the new um, <clears throat> CRM simulation. So I'm gonna do the old copy paste. Uh, oh no, wait, I do have it set up. My, my bad. So let's, it's already set up to run for, let's see. In this case, it's actually doing a five month churn calculation. I don't know how I made that up, but I, I don't know why I was looking at that. <laughs> oh, okay, here to learn to code and, and, and practice some English. That's good. I hope my English is uh, reasonable <laughs> or not too hard to hear. And I hope the music's not too loud. But anyway, we're, we're doing some, some uh, some SQL coding. Maybe we'll have some Python in another stream, but today it's SQL and I'm running these SQL scripts with a Python. So here was my my SQL and I run this with a Python program, which is why I'm using PyCharm. So let's try this for this CRM version. So here in this case, we were doing 151 day period churn calculation. Now, why would you ever do that? You probably wouldn't ever measure churn in 151 days. Oh, hey, thanks for um, for following or subscribing. Um, so let's see. So you probably wouldn't ever measure churn in 151 days, except in one situation. Let's say your company had only been in existence for 150 days. <laughs> then you might want to measure your churn in 150 days. And then you would want to know what's my monthly churn rate based on these 150 days. So if you had 246 out of 2508 churns in 150 days, you'd have a 9.8% churn rate. But then in a year, you could expect to have a 22% churn rate. And in a month, you could expect to have a 2% churn rate. So that's all using um, this churn scaling equation. <laughs> oh, well, that's cool. Welcome, uh, Donovan GX uh, from Mexico. And yeah, glad to have you. Anyone who's from all around the world interested in data, data science, churn, SQL, um, any of the any subset of those, very welcome to have you. Um, so let's see. So that kind of ends the activity-based churn calculation, um, unless someone else had any questions or comments about it. Let's see. What did I say here? Um, what do I recommend to do coding in for a beginner? Hmm. Well, I mean, Python is pretty easy. I mean, yeah, probably Python because 
I mean, a lot of people use it for a lot of things, especially if you do data science or machine learning, Python is pretty much the go-to language nowadays, which is why I use Python. It's also easy to learn, um, I think. I mean, I don't know if other people in the chat, like, what do you think? Is Python easy to learn or hard to learn? It's definitely easier to learn than like C or C++ or Java, which are strongly typed languages. So I don't know what the go-to learning language is nowadays, but Python will, be easy to learn and probably help you get a job. But anyway, let's actually talk about what I put up. Ooh, what project can you do? That's a harder question. I mean, look online. So I'm not really like a, a learn to code stream. I'm My stream is kind of like if people already know coding um, and SQL, you pretty much have to know some Python and SQL before you get into what I do, but then it could be good practice. Um, but you definitely, I, I'll give a plug for my publisher, Manning Publications. All right, hold on, hold on. I got to plug my publisher. Let's find Manning Publications. They have great books for learning because um, they, and they actually use cognitive science uh, principles to teach coding. So I'll just give a plug for Manning. And also, oh, the discount code from my stream, I think will give you a discount on any book at Manning. Um, stay to the end so I give uh, the discount code and you can, I think it's good for any, uh, any book. I, I tell people it's only for my book so that they'll be more likely to buy my book. But if you're just learning to code, you can use it for you know anything. All right, so I was gonna make this last important point that there is a time when annual churn is 12 times monthly churn, but it's only for low churn rates, basically below around 2%, as you can see here. Um, and that just comes out from the math that it ends up being practically indistinguishable. If you do 12 times monthly churn versus the exact annual churn, at low churn rates below around 2%, it's practically the same thing. And you can save yourself the trouble and just do 12X. Um, but you can see that as your churn rate gets higher into the 3%, 4% range, and this is the range of most streaming services. Most stream Netflix has like a 3% churn rate and Apple TV has like a 6% churn rate. So this is kind of the rate of most streaming services. Um, it becomes a big difference. And of course, if you go high enough, 12 times churn goes up above 100%, 12 times monthly churn. So clearly, if you get up to like around 8%, then your, or 9%, your annual churn cannot be 12 times your monthly churn because you can't have greater than 100% churn. Okay, and D3 Valeo seconds me on Python being a good language to start learning. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Let's see. So what's left in the stream? Okay, there's only one subject left, um, and this is what I called the bonus because this was not in the original book, uh, Fighting Churn with Data. Um, so I'm just going to go, it's a new listing, you can find it in the repo, but I don't describe it in the book, it's just something Basically, someone asked me about this at one point, all, is, which is that all of the churn calculations I showed you today are just for one month. But what if you want to look at it for more than one month um, and not redo the calculation again and again? It's actually a pretty simple extension to the SQL. And so if you look in GitHub, uh, in the code on GitHub, I've added new listings uh, six through eight. Um, which are not in the book. Um, you won't find these in the book, only on GitHub, and I'm and it's really only being explained for the first time ever um, in this live stream right now. So how can we use the same techniques to do multiple periods of churn calculation in one SQL? So what we're gonna do is instead of having in the other versions, I had a CTE with a start and end date. Um, like let's uh, look at churn rate. In this simple version, we have we just have a start date and an end date, right? Uh, let's close this up. But in the multiple churn rate, we're gonna use here the Postgres function generate series. Now there's probably equivalence to this in most other databases. If your database does not have equivalent of generate series, what can you do? Well, you can make a table that has, and just insert the dates that you want into a, temp, a table or a temporary table. 
Um, but this is going to give me a temporary table with a series of dates. That's the first step in doing a multi-month calculation. The next step is that you need to modify each of these CTEs, common table expressions, to have the dates from your series. So here I'm using the same variable D, but now calc dates is a series of dates and I'm including them um, in this uh, start account table. So now I'm actually calculating for multiple months what are the starting accounts using the same logic uh, for everyone. And I'm also going to do the end accounts. I'm including the start date um, from the calculation series uh, in the table. So I've got many months of data. And here I also need to um, you know, do interval calculations. Like in the old version, in the end dates, I just had like an end date you know, for this. But now I'm actually going to use an interval calculation um, from my series. So the, the, for the subscription to be active, it has to be, the start date of the subscription has to be within the inner, you know, within the start date plus a one month interval. Um, and the end date has to be after the start date plus the one month interval. So now, again, in my churn date calculation, I need to cal carry through this start date variable. So instead of just doing an outer join, the original version I did the outer join on account ID. Now I also need to join on the dates, which I'm just calling start date everywhere. Maybe I should have used a different name for that, but add uh, details, details. Um, but we still have the outer join condition that you want the account ID in the end accounts table to be null, which means basically that you didn't find in, uh, such an account. But again, I'm carrying through the start date. Um, and now when I do my start counts, I actually need to group by the start dates. Um, and the ends I need to group by that date. So in the original calculation, this start count and end count was just a simple count star. I didn't even need to group by anything to do the aggregation. Now you have to group by the dates. But at this point, I'll have two separate lists of start counts, um, start and end count, start and churn counts, really, the number that started and churned in each month. And now I can calculate uh, my final result with an inner join um, on these on the date. So each of my monthly calculations lines up. Um, and then in each one of those months, the churn calculation is basically the same. So let's r try running that one and see what we get. Let's see, CRM5, I want to do, let's like, duplicate this again, call this multi-month churn. And now this should be listing six. And this one, I think it actually saves a result because it's like I was working with this. Yeah, so saving to my output directory. Let's go look there and see what my result was. So in the stream output, it has now created a subfolder. And here is my result. Churn rate multi, save 12.32 p.m. my local time, which is now. So we'll open it up. Let's see, oh, I have, it's gonna launch Microsoft Excel, that's fine. Occasionally, Microsoft Excel has crashed my streams. Hopefully, this will not be one of those times. But no, it's okay. So here now is our, my multi-month churn calculation. And we can convert these all to percents. And I also did the annual churn. So this was the output of that script. I see, yeah, I actually remember. Yeah, I, I also included in this the annual churn rate here, which is using, so this is actually combining all the, all the tricks from today's stream. We have the outer join for the churn calculation, um, and then the scaling to get an annual churn rate, and we're doing it for multiple months at a time. And so yeah, so this is the result that you get out of that. And there are similar calculations. I'm not actually gonna go through them um, because 
well, I think it would just be excessive. I'll leave it as an exercise for the reader to go through. This is an MRR, a multi-month MRR churn uh, calculation where we're also um, carrying through uh, the MRR amounts to get a final uh, churn calculation, which is somewhat more complicated. But yeah, like I said, I'll leave that as an exercise for the streamer um, to, you know, check this out in GitHub. If you ever need to do a multi-month uh, MRR churn rate calculation, um, this is how you could do it. And also, you know, I didn't do a multi-month activity churn calculation. So that was the churn rate based on um, activity. So that's the real exercise for a dedicated streamer would be to actually do a multi-month activity-based churn. Um, so, yeah. So there we go. I think uh, that is everything. Five different four different churn rate calculations plus time period conversion plus multi-period churn calc and that's what I'm calling the top five churn calculations there you go <laughs> all right that was that's kind of it summary um, well there's the basics fighting churn is about targeted interventions improvements engagement support um, Churn company, churn compares lost customers or dollars. I'd say customers with a dollar sign or money. Of course, now we have uh, street viewers watching here in France and Mexico. It's whatever your, you know, your currency is, of course. So you compare your lost customers to your starting customers and acquisitions, new signups are ignored uh, for churn. Um, churn is easily calculated for big data using SQL. So clearly you could do this um, in an Excel spreadsheet if you didn't have that many customers. And many companies do that. But if you're you know, a data scientist or a machine learning engineer, you have some real data to work with, SQL is definitely the way to go. Um, so multiple measures of churn. Consumer products um, or products with what, just a few price points, you'll probably use the standard churn calculation. For business products, you are going to use a revenue churn calculation. And that's products where you have a lot of different price points. And well, more importantly, your top customers pay a lot more than your small customers. That's when you really want to use revenue churn. Now, re reporting to investors, you're gonna use net retention. Why net retention for investors? One, investors like it because it's a good business metric. Number two, it hides your churn. <laughs> so don't use net retention for analyzing churn. Do use net retention for reporting to investors. Lastly, there was activity-based churn, uh, which is for ad or purchase-based products, I mean purchase based, meaning retail, like you can do activity churn for retail and some companies do. They'll say, oh, this customer, more for, you know, products that people buy repeatedly, say groceries or cosmetics. That's when you're going to do a retail churn calculation where you would look at, you know, how long has it been since they've purchased? And if it goes beyond oh, 60, 90 days, you might consider that customer a churn. Um, same for ad supported products. Okay, so there you go. I think that's all I had to say today, unless anyone in the chat has other questions about anything we've talked about or anything related to Python, SQL, data science. Okay, here's one question, d 3 Valeo. How would you go about selecting an appropriate interval for activity churn? Look at the median time between activities. Yeah, I would look at what you want to do is set it long enough that most people who go beyond that don't come back. So clearly, if you looked at one day, you'd find that most people who don't use the product for one day are back soon after. But if you looked at all customers who had not used your product for 12 months, you'd probably find very few of them um, have would come back after being gone for 12 months. And if you analyze that at multiple time points, you'd probably find like an elbow um, where, you know, you'd get to a certain point beyond which most 
you kind of capture most of the difference. So that didn't give you an exact answer, I'm sorry. I'm more proposing an analysis where for different lengths of time, you look at what is the percentage that still come back after going dormant for that length of time. And then you kind of have to use your judgment. Um, so yeah, and remember, you always have the problem of re-signups in all four of these. Like with ad and purchase supported, you might set it at like six months and then you'll have some customer who like goes six months without using the product and then, oh, six months and one day they come back. Oh, well, that's annoying. But in subscription products, you have exactly the same thing, especially for streaming products where if it's sports, people come back for their favorite sport every year. Or if it's a series based um, service like HBO or Netflix, for example, they you watch the next season of your favorite show. Uh, I don't even know what's popular nowadays. Murder in the house. Actually, wait a second. Nothing's popular nowadays because all the actors and writers are still on strike. So now we're all watching old series and shows now. I wonder what that's doing to churn rates. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. So no one answer for the appropriate interval for activity churn, but it's usually going to be 90 days, 90 days to six months probably is what most people are going to use. Okay, and lastly, okay, here is where you can get my book um, at manning.com with a 40% off coupon. And I'm 99% sure um, for uh, Z270F6, um, that approach is, that coupon is good for actually any book on Manning and they have great books on learning to program with Python. Uh, I'm actually not sure off the top of my head, which is a good one, because I haven't used a learning to code with Python book for a long time myself. Um, they also have projects. They have projects you can do, like practice projects, which might be interesting. Okay, and of course, I have to put in a plug for myself. Follow me for updates. Um, now, <clears throat> do you guys know Linktree? I'm gonna, I'll do a quick demo of Linktree. Um, we are now in, I used to give out my, uh, it's like link tree, Carl 24 K. And here you, whoops, here you can get my link tree, which actually has all of my links because we are in like a multi, uh, multi social network world nowadays. Are we not? I usually just try to drive people to, you know, you know, follow me on the service formerly known as Twitter now uh the one that sounds like a porn site x but nowadays i go multi you know i am multi-social i'm on mastodon i'm on linkedin i'm on threads i'm still on twitter i guess i have to update this and you can see all my other links here you guys don't need my twitch link you know i'm on twitch but anyway follow me for updates on whatever social network you think is the one to be on nowadays i have no idea I spend most of my time on Mastodon, I'll be honest, but it's just more interesting. But please follow me for updates. Also, did you like the music today? I'll just give a plug for, this was the Chill Hop Mix by Wadeco. Um, so, I don't know, this is a pretty good Chill Hop Mix. I do a different stream safe mix almost every week. Um, Oh, oh yeah, off topic, D3 Valeo just asked, is that Lo-Fi or Star Wars? I have no idea what it was, but it was the Chill Hop mix by Wadeco on Spotify. Um, yeah, it is a pretty good playlist. I would definitely do this one again. I would definitely use this mix again. It was a little slow at some points. So what other book could be helpful? Do you mean for Python or SQL? Um, and I don't know, I just, I can, I can just tell you, if I go here and I just search for learn Python, I know it'll come up with something. A quick Python book, third edition. Well, we like quick books. As you'll see, all Manning books have like an old fashioned person on their cover, which I don't know how I feel about that, but at least on mine, they got the churner. Um, Clear, crisp, updated into introduction to the elegant Python programming language. 
And what I will say about Manning's books is they're all written with cognitive science uh, principles. I know because when I tried to write my book, they taught me cognitive science principles. I didn't know anything about the cognitive science principles of learning, but I learned them in order to write my book. But it means they use good mental models, you know, good explanations, you know, they call out the key concepts. So I'll just give a plug for Manning. I know they're not the most popular technical publisher. A lot of people go to the technical publisher that has animals on the cover. Um, I won't mention them, but I don't think they use good cognitive science principles. So just a plug for Manning. They're an independent publisher. They're really great. All right. And thank you. This is the time when I thank people. Um, let's see. I'm actually going to, we're going to go thank Sundy Dundee for following me. I'm going to go through everyone who has an interesting, uh, name who followed me recently thank you this one's good hold on it takes a while lab rat learner thank you for following me these are actually replays of the follows that i can do in my streaming software this is another good name coming up another good one thank you one perational i don't know if any of you guys are watching um so this is like shout outs to people. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but also thank you again to the new follower in today's stream, Z270FX. I don't know what your Twitch handle means, but is it like hexadecimal or something? I'm gonna have to like try to convert that. Uh, let's see, any other good names? Oh, here's, here's another good one. Another good new uh, follower, John the Home. There's another good Twitch handle. Any of you guys out there, I usually don't catch these people again when I'm actually you know, streaming. But if you do follow me when I'm not around, I will um, you know, give you a shout out. So please do. Uh, let's see. Let's see. And also all these end up in video demand on YouTube. I know y'all don't uh, need to hear that because you're all on Twitch. They're also on demand on Twitch later if you missed the beginning. But I just mentioned that because you might have friends who use YouTube. And next stream should be, I'm targeting Saturday, December 2nd. Um, it will be the Fighting Turn with Data Master Class. That's what I'm calling this, the Master Class. Based on the advanced churn simulation, stream three will be on feature engineering, the most important subject in data science and machine learning. That's what I say. Feature engineering is practically the most important subject for the success of your data science machine learning projects. So should be a good one if, um, if you're new to the subject or if you are already advanced, I can promise you some, some new tips and tricks that you probably don't already know. So it'll be a lot of fun, uh, but I'm not streaming that regularly these days. I think I've mentioned that, I mean, I have a full-time job. I'm not like, <clears throat> I'm not really a streamer uh, by trade. <laughs> I'm actually uh, the head of data science for a startup company called OfferFit, uh, which is a very busy, demanding day job. My work-life balance is kind of in the pits, but you know, that's startup life. Um, but I'll make time to stream. So thank you all for watching today, those of you who, who are here, and especially thank you for those who chatted with me. It's always better to feel like, you know, um, I'm not here by myself and stuff. But yeah, it should be same time, same place, um, Saturday, December 2nd. So thank you all. Again, have a great Saturday. Um, for those of you who it's still daytime, I know someone was out in France, get some sleep. Um, or go clubbing now 